This is the Dane Moore MBA podcast brought to you by Prize Picks coming to you Thursday morning. It's April 1st after the Wolves' 48 point win over the Toronto Raptors on Wednesday night. I got Britt Robson here with me. And Britt and I were sitting together at the game uh, last night in Media Row. And at the beginning of the third quarter, and I was like, man, what, it, what, what should we talk about? What, what should we talk about tomorrow? Uh, we knew there just wasn't going to be a lot to to dig into from this Raptors game specifically. So I, I said, what should we talk about? And you just kind of started rattling off some things. You're good at that. Uh, and, and I was writing <laughs> them down and I was like, these are all playoff topics. And maybe that's just everything thematically right now. Not that, not to take away from these games, but kind of, it's about what are you going to look like going into the playoffs? What are, what are recent themes over the, the final month that sort of, connect into the way that you're going to you know be able to play so i decided we make that the theme of today's episode not well, we could talk a little bit about the game last night and the, obviously the games recently but what are the wolves going to look like uh in the playoffs just kind of ping around topics about this team recently uh, and then look at them through a playoff lens so again i got Britt here with me what's up Britt? well i mean one of the reasons i mentioned that is because i you were saying, what should we talk about? And I've been thinking about uh, things that I don't have answers for. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, you know, and sometimes that's good to have when you're having an open conversation is to wrestle with things in public mm -hmm. because, I mean, right off the bat, I could say uh, Monte Morris or J-Mac in the playoffs or neither. Uh, <laughs> I mean, those are the three options. And mm -hmm. I think a case can be made for all three, um, but I would not want to have to make that decision. Right. Uh, or both, I guess, is also a fourth option, although that really extends the bench mm -hmm. um, more than playoffs traditionally do. So uh, that was one of the things I thought about. I also was, you know, mucking around with various standings and playoff options. I don't know if everybody knows this or not, but as best I can tell, the Wolves have clinched a top three seed. So, uh, right. you know, they're 53 and 23. The Clips are 47 and 28. So, oh, I guess that means they could win. Uh, no, well, I guess technically I see it there. They're going to be, if, they're going to be a top three ahead. seed. They're yeah. going to be a top three seed. They, if the, if the Wolves beat the Wizards or the Clippers don't win out, then they're going to uh, get right. the top three seed. So I think that's, instructive in terms of we won't play Los Angeles or Golden the Lakers or Golden State mm -hmm. unless uh, they somehow rise up and get to that 7-8 slot and then win out. Well, Los Angeles or Golden State, the Lakers or the Warriors, they very well could play because they could be the eighth seed and the Wolves could be the one seed. They probably will. Oh, play. yeah, that's right. right. That's yeah. right. That's, I, I, I gamed it out. <laughs> I, I looked at Denver's schedule, man, and I'll tell you. It's going to be hard for Denver not to be the one seed, uh, you know. Yeah, they, yeah. they have they have uh, five. I count five wins in their next six games and one toss up, and the toss up is the Wolves game. Right. The I'm Wolves is really to... by far the toughest game left on their mm -hmm. schedule, and every other game just doesn't look like a hard game to me. Right. Um, well, I, I think the. I think like you said, the like J-Mac game, Monte Morris, like that, those are kind of a lot of the the thing, like those are small things, right? And and bounce around to some of those. I think everyone out there who's watching the Wolves is is thinking about the biggest Wolves through the playoff lens related question is, is the cat reintegration and what that looks like and all that. I actually don't want to start with that. Yeah. Because I think he's not coming back for the first round, in my opinion. Well, but that's just your opinion. I mean, yeah. Shams's yeah. opinion is he's coming back before the regular season ends. Maybe that's not right either. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't matter what people's opinions are about right, when right, he comes back. Right. It's you don't want him to come back in in the first round. Absolutely not. I so, so okay. All right, never mind. Let's do the cat reintegration thing right after. <laughs> I was gonna say there's all these other different things that I think help frame that, but we can but we can do the cat thing right off the top. I think we don't know exactly what to think about the cat thing. I do think I do think it's nuts to say that cat coming back is going to hurt this team. I think cat coming back not fully healthy 
and eager to show that he is back, back, is not a good scenario. You know what I you would, can do? You know what you can do in that scenario? Not play him. Then and becomes, what, what is that going to – I mean, you know, again – Who cares? You're yeah. going for the championship this mm-hmm. year. Like well, that, that is, that is on, well, I don't know. I mean, it's not like there aren't measures in which you can do that. If cat is overly assertive and all those different things, I just think, and man, I do this all the time too with cat, like our brains go to assuming the worst. And, and I think there's a proper framing in which to do here where it's like, there there's cats, not going to for sure come back 60% overexert himself and be terrible in that because of it. Now, is he going to have some of his cat snafus and do some of those sort of things? Probably he's done that when he's healthy in the playoffs, but I, I just, I think it's not going to be worse for the team. I think it's going to disrupt the team when, when cat gets back because our disruptions making things better or worse. I, it, and that's why it's saying you can, you can call that you can move things around to do it. I mean, I think the idea that if, if you had to trade cat for Nas and Nas was all of a sudden had to go to the 15 day DL, and you couldn't play him, then I, th- I I think I would probably would argue the Wolves would be worse. You can bring Cat back and not lose Nas, and and you can and you have as much autonomy as you ever have with Cat to be like we are going to shape your role in which we think is best fit for this situation. You're coming off an injury. We're rolling right now. We you can come back slowly, much like they have with D'Angelo Russell injuries at this time of year a couple years ago other players who have gotten injured rudy like there are plenty of parameters in which to use cat you know effectively and not play him if if you don't want to there are tons of excuses there i think i i think he nas fits this better let's let's review what happened the last time cat was out and he came back sure he was immediately put in the starting lineup. He hit the game winner and said he was really happy that he was immediately put back in and he's glad he was able to reassert himself and he wants to be the go-to guy going forward. Doesn't see why he shouldn't be. Um, a lot has changed then in terms of uh, Ant's emergence and everything. Yeah, the team but, got good. Well, what I will tell you is a guy making the money Cat makes, listening to what people say about Cat, knowing what kind of personality he has, and knowing his own faith in his own abilities, I think if he is less than 100%, he will still argue to play. Then it's up to the team to figure out that. But it is going to be... Here, here, I guess what I let me just put out what I would argue for. I would argue for a slow, sure, steady integration that doesn't fully begin until deep into the first round, if then, because I think you want to be able to ride the momentum you have built and bring him along slowly. And I think if you bring him along, medium to full, it is going to be very difficult to walk that back. And so therefore, you are going to be put in a position where you're creating a controversy. I would forestall the controversy by making sure it is a very slow, gradual return. Sure. And I agree that may that may even be, you know, uh you know, mop up duty or minutes restriction twelve. Too 15, far, 20. too far, too far, too far, too far. Okay, well, that, that mop up duty. You're gonna give him the same minutes as Leonard Miller. I mean, it, it, it's got to be closer to what what happened when he came back for the playoffs last year. In the first game, he came back to play a game against the Lakers. It was awesome. Well, that was yes, that, that's true. How long had he been back by then? Zero. No. Yeah, was it? Yeah, wasn't the Lakers game what he came back for? Am I, am I messing that up? The play-in game? No, no, he was already back. Remember, that's what I mean. The, the whole scenario where he... Uh... Oh, mo- this is what movies is made of? Yeah. Um, <laughs> hold on. Okay, all right, all right. 
I, so, I was thinking about that because Rudy didn't play in that game. That's what it was. Right, right, exactly. You're right, you're right. No, my bad, my bad. He no, played. That's okay. And and you and I both knew he would have a good game. Why did we no. know he would have a good game? Because there, there was, was nothing no to lose. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No. Nope, I mean, there was no, there wasn't that type of pressure on him. Mm-hmm. It he was. Did play, he played uh, eight of the last final nine games. That's what happened. And, and he had the chance to be the hero or just be a, a warrior against bad odds. It's a very good position to be in mentally. Mm-hmm. And so consequently, I knew he would play well. Mm-hmm. Um, look, I'm not bashing Cat. I'm just saying that what I see you on the You did just bash Cat. You did just bash Cat. You said play him in mop-up duty. Like, we we, we got to, like, that. that's not going to happen and wrong. I mean, that's wrong. Like, he should play, Britt. He should play. It's about – you were saying it before. Like, playing him the right way, the right integration. I'm – Right. I well, just that's what that's... I mean. I, I And when I mean mop-up duty, I don't mean throughout the playoffs. I just mean that it has to be a situation where you do not lose. They've won nine out of ten games. And Finch has flexibility now. It's not, again, mm-hmm. it is because they have five ironclad starters when all are healthy and you want to play those starters as a unit, and they've done very well together. But that means that you are making your matchup decisions in the second rotation. Mm-hmm. Fitch is able to make his matchup decisions in the first rotation now because a starter is out. He can put in Nas if he wants to. He can put in Slow Mo if he wants to. He can put Na in if he wants to in that fifth slot. And that changes the complexion of the team, and that flexibility – is one of the reasons why they're playing well. Facts. Okay. So, in that way, the return of Cat disrupts that decision-making process, limits that flexibility, Mm -hmm. and that is not bashing Cat to say that his absence has created good things. I just wanted to push back on the mop-up duty. I I agree. I agree on that. All right. The mop-up duty, what I really meant by that is if you begin to put – cat in a role that is a significant role Mm -hmm. and he doesn't thrive immediately in that i think it will be difficult to ratchet it back and if you have to ratchet it back then there's a controversy then there's and it's on a big stage i just think the stakes justify that risk in my opinion right like the stakes justify the the possibility of his upside versus the downside of the quote-unquote controversy or whatever i'm at the point where i just don't think it's that controversial anymore cat is unambiguously the third best player on this team at this point which isn't to take away from him being a good player i think he's just as good as he ever was but when it's, it's, will he be the again the third best player on this team that's what i'm pushing back on and, and that's why i think we get into the nas point right because nas is is the difference here and i so now, i feel like i've been doing the the cat defending here i think nas is unambiguously a better fit with the rest of the roster than cat is absolutely he has a greater ability to read the floor he reads it faster and he retains that knowledge more than cat does that's that's the decisiveness we see right i don't i don't think because Nas is necessarily, I don't think it's because Nas is necessarily smarter than Cat, right? I think it's because he had to survive in, he had to survive in the league, right? He had to develop those skills so as to be able to understand the, those things. He's grown in them because he was an undrafted player who even at the start of last season was out of the rotation to start the season Nas was. Mm-hmm. Cat was the number one pick. It's the same thing with Ant, right? Like Ant, Nikhil Alexander Walker has a higher basketball IQ than Anthony Edwards does because Nikhil's gone through the fire, right? He's had to learn. He's had to, to be able to get the spot, to get the minutes, to have success. He's had to do those things. And, and Nas has too. So Nas is a better fit on this team. He has a higher basketball IQ than Cat does. He's quote unquote smarter in that way. What I can't get over is that you can keep playing Nas and have Cat. You just need to be firmly and directly about to Cat about what it is you want his role to look like okay. at the beginning. Here's what I would push back on. Okay. I would push back on the idea that because Cat is a number one overall pick and has been less 
able to scrabble or less able to be in a position where he has to change, it's just not so. I mean, he's playing a position that's not suited sure. for him. Yeah. I think the different. I mean, the reason why Nas is a better fit right now is because Nas can sculpt his body to be a quick four, and Cat cannot. And so, therefore, you have a situation where you put Nas on the floor with a guy who can play small ball center in slow mo, and you have a bunch of passers around him, and you play the motion game. Even if Cat wants to play the motion game, he's got size 24 feet or something. Sure. He's not going to play the motion game that way. So I think the fit has to do with dimensions, things that neither Cat nor – I mean, Nas can change it, but Cat can't change it. Nas turned himself – from a 264-pound chubby 6'9 rookie into a guy who's now a combo forward who can passably guard the low post, but that's not what he really could do. Cat sometimes wants to guard the low post uh, versus games where he has to be out on the perimeter. Uh, it's just a, they're two different players. Sure, They have similar offensive skills in some ways, but Nas off the bounce and Cat off the bounce, again, very, very different. Sure. And the way they're treated. Cat will face double teams immediately. Nas is still not there yet uh, in terms of when Nas goes off the dribble, uh, I don't think he has the same double team coverage that Cat is scouted for. So I do think there's important differences, and I think that uh, – I, I agree. That's, what, what one you... of the, that's one of the reasons why, again, um, I want to go slow here with Cat. Yeah, and I, I, I'm with that. I'm just, again, what I can't get over is the idea that it will hurt if sculpted correctly. Adding a player back, you don't a have mighty to get biggest. rid of. Sure, I, I know, but the Wolves are not going to the, the only way the Wolves are going to the NBA Finals is if they effectively reintegrate Carl Anthony Towns, in my opinion. I would agree with that. So that's the goal, right? you got yes, to try to do that, right? And then you ask right. yourself difficult questions about, for example, do you just bring Cat off the bench? You know, like that would be yeah. a very like basic way to think about it. There's all these different things they can do rotationally, whatever. But that's just one sort of thing. What you could, again, just in theory, start the same five you've been starting and your team's been rolling and doing all that. And then you have Cat come in you know, for Rudy or whatever. And he's the, right. he's the five in that spot. Like, I think, I think they have answers to this test right now that they've been tasked with since cat's been out. And I think it's wrong to say, not that you were necessarily, but I think it's wrong to say they can't find answers to the new test. Once he comes back, because you can just, you can just bench him. You can just move his minutes around you can do things if you let go of the politics of the situation then you can empower cat you can empower the the entire roster and like i get it he's a he's a super max player but to me the situation justifies the means and maybe it just doesn't even go bad maybe it just works and he just fits back into it you don't even need to get to that point where you're like yeah we're not like we're gonna have cat off the bench we're not we're gonna play nas here over him like i just I think it's being viewed as like a a dangerous thing when, yeah, there's some risk involved of the controversy and all that sort of stuff. It's just hard for me to not look at the upside when like when I'm playing a game, I'm playing the game to win and to win this game this season. You got to have every bullet in the chamber and know how to shoot it, you know, effectively. And I think, Cat's cat's a pretty big one of that. I mean, everybody who's listening to me knows like I have a tons of frustration with the way that Carl's been used, the way he uses himself. Although a lot of the the mental elements, particularly related to the playoffs, but like at the same time, this is a special player that if you use him in the right way around this group, like it it's weird to me that the idea is that it would make them worse. I guess that's where I'm at. And I don't think it's weird. I think it is a possibility, not a probability, but a possibility that, again, given the stakes involved, has to be carefully considered sure. and mitigated against. 
that we're on the same a, page with that, right? You, okay. you get that I'm with that too, right? Like well, yeah, making except, difficult I mean, decisions. Like the ability to keep praising Cat as somebody who is a special player, who was the third best player on the team and everything, would argue that it is kind of a no-brainer that you put him in as soon as possible. And what I am saying is that's fair. You cannot yep. ignore. What is going? What did Slomo say in the locker room the other day when we asked him why he was playing well? You know, well, no offense against Cat, but I mean, I'm here at the four and I play a lot better at the four, so on mm -hmm. and so forth. That's a fact. Yeah. Nas playing beside Slomo is really working well. That's a fact. Um, the idea that the flexibility thing I mentioned before, that's a fact. Now, Cat could come in and rain seven threes in and win a game. Hold on. Could, could you not do those things? Can, can Slow-Mo still play the four when Cat comes back? Yes. Can Nas and Slow-Mo still play together when Cat comes back? Yes. So where is Rudy in that rotation? Well, it, Rudy's still doing his same thing. Okay, you, so do they start Slow-Mo or do they bring him off the bench? And if they bring him off the bench, do they bring him off the bench as the, the three? Or do they put him in for Rudy? No, I, I I think a big unlocker of this whole idea is going uh -huh. with the three big lineup. Cat, Nas, Rudy, all at the same time, being able to go to that. There's just there's a bunch of different answers for this. You could play Cat more exclusively at the five when Rudy is out. There, there you go. There's 14 minutes a night for Cat. And then you give him another. Maybe his limit minutes are limited at the beginning. Give him 14 minutes at the four at other at other times. And then Kyle's playing. Kyle and Nas are taking care of the other 34. There's a puzzle here, and I don't think it's impossible to solve, provided you're okay with Cap playing a different role, maybe a different minute load than than he's used to. That that to me, that's all it's about. We do have to grab our, our first break here. We can keep we can keep going on it, but we're over 20 minutes. Um, today's show is brought to you by Falling Knife Brewing Company and Britt and myself and Kyle. We will all be at Falling Knife on April 19th to yell at each other like this. And uh, they'll be right before, right before the first playoff game. We'll know more about Cat then. Um, I'm just, I'm excited about this. I'm excited uh, just for all the fans to kind of go to Falling Knife uh, over the course of uh, the playoffs to watch the games for the Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday games. We're going to have that big TV truck out in the, kind of like side parking lot area by the patio there. So, you know, it'll be spring. There'll be the, the games will be on outside as well as inside there. But the live show is me, Britt and uh, Kyle on April 19th uh, at Falling Knife. I'll be, get there. I would say get there at like six to get a spot. Um, and we'll start. We'll kind of set up, do a happy hour, uh, set up and start the show at seven. So April 19th. Falling Knife uh, Brewing Company. And then also just uh, quickly, today's show is also brought to you by Prize Picks, prizepicks.com, Prize Picks app. As we've been mentioning this week, it's baseball season. Um, that's another thing you can you can check out on, on Prize Picks. And uh, obviously, in addition to uh, these NBA games uh, that we're looking at every night again, prizepicks.com, Prize Picks app, promo code Dane. Look how I just use that ad read to like as a counter punch <laughs> in our argument right there. <laughs> Shut up, Britt. Shut up. <laughs> I have no problem with it. I enjoy argument, as you know, winning and losing. I don't. I don't think there's. I don't. I don't think either of us are winning or losing. I think it's mm -hmm. just a. I think it's just about Finch's willingness to mess around with all of it, and 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 what buttons he's he's willing to to press. And I think Britt just like at the end of the day, you use the you take your shot this season with Cap. And you know, and if I'm wrong, there's there's more seasons to come, and sure. the higher upside move. I think the higher up highest upside move right now is playing with Cat and taking a shot with him in the fold. And uh, next season, maybe it isn't. Maybe mm -hmm. in the off season, you do trade him and you and you make a different move and and you go in that direction. I'm saying right now, you're one of the best teams in the NBA. Go, go and see how far you can go. I'm sorry, I don't think. You go as far as you can go if you don't take the shot, you know, with Cat. And again, what I would say is I agree with you. I think what we're talking about is not after round one. I think what we're talking about is finding out exactly what we have and finding it out in a way 
that doesn't create tension and friction where it doesn't need to be. I think, for example, against Denver, Cat is extremely important on defense because he can guard Jokic and let Rudy mm -hmm. float. I want a healthy Cat. If it ever comes down to a conference finals between the Wolves and Denver, sure. yes, I absolutely want Cat instead of Nas in the lineup against that team, notwithstanding what happened the last time Denver and Minnesota played. I think there are definitely ways and Cat could be extremely helpful for this team. And I think there are ways in which the reverse of what I'm worried about can happen, yeah. that he can come in in a limited capacity and play extremely well, and that will give him the kind of confidence he needs to not only play relatively aggressively, but play the way the rest of the team is playing. And then you have a great shooting big man playing in a caliber that makes the Wolves even tougher. That's mm -hmm. the best case scenario. Right now, I think the risk reward on that best case scenario is much cloudier in the first round than it is if they get past the first yeah. round. And so I am arguing for caution. I'm not saying that Cat deserves to be tossed aside and the future is mm -hmm. with what the lineup of the last 15 games has been. I am saying that we have moving parts that right. are undetermined and we have parts recently in place that are determined. Mm -hmm. The status quo, we just got through briefly talking about J-Mac Monte, that's going to be a piece that is going to change. There are going to be parts that are going to change regardless. Mm -hmm. and, and this really good vibes time for the sake of competitiveness and playoff atmosphere and the way teams scout each other, et cetera, will force changes. What I am saying is you want to obviously keep the goodness and try to enhance the goodness. And that's where status quo versus change mm -hmm. comes into play. Um, Cat has a playoff history. He hasn't been terrible and he hasn't been great. He's been both. And that is a yo-yo that I would like to mitigate some, keep the highs, reduce the lows. And one of the ways I think you do that is by integrating him slowly, getting him in a place where he feels good about himself and the team is continuing the momentum that it has. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I think that is a caution, uh, a caution position. And I, and I, think, I think I push that. No, no, no. I, I think I push back too much at the, the beginning of like, again, a tricky part about this is we don't know the injury. We don't know like the right, status. Exactly. Of it. Right. And I think you kind of like struck a chord with me at the beginning of like, don't play him until the second round. I think there's a scenario in which it makes sense, depending on how the injury works. Like uh -huh. does it, does an extra two weeks, get you from 65% to 85%. Uh -huh. That I, I'd be I'd be interested in weighing the opportunity cost of that of like maybe don't play him in the first round to get from 65 to 85% to to do that. My whole point is let's approach every single day, every single game strategically egoless and smart. What do exactly. we need now going for like and it's a group Right. And, and that's one of the biggest things I think has changed this season. There were so many games last season where they closed a game when they shouldn't have with Rudy Gobert. Mm -hmm. right. You know, it just wasn't, it wasn't, they hadn't figured out how to play with them and they would get, you know, they would get, were get, getting exposed by the right. fact that they had a big on the floor against the small. It's like letting go of that stuff, the politics of it is Absolutely. one huge reason why this team, I think is got, you know, is one of the best teams in the NBA where right now might be, the number one seed going into the going into the playoffs and that while difficult to apply to your loyal longest standing player on your team who's very good right. you know is is difficult to apply but the stakes require the means i think at at this point to to be able to do that and um i think a good thing about this team is relationally 
I think they're in a good spot, you know, and, and, and not on, that, on ca- that we're in hundred percent agreement. I would even argue that, um, this, I see people, for example, who say, you know, LeBron and the Lakers, they don't want them on a one, eight matchup, you know, uh, AD and all this other stuff or all the, mm-hmm. I, I take a hard look at all these teams, these legacy teams, you know, Durant's legacy, LeBron's legacy, you know, the Clippers, their, their core, their legacy. Um, and what I see as a team that in some weird way has used this cat disruption. When the, the day cat got hurt, I remember tweeting out, you know, cat, it, it would be lunacy to say that cat um, injury makes the wolves better. But this is an opportunity for Nas and Slomo to step up and to be better yeah. players. Um, that's that's happened. Sure. And and what that means is that in the chess match of how playoffs happen, you do this, therefore I do this, the Wolves have a bigger brain or more, however you want to define more options. Mm-hmm. If, the, if the Wolves opponents try to do something to counter whatever the wolves have learned the wolves have a have a really nice starting five or not wolves have a really nice quintet of players sure. that feature three former centers the wolves also have a really nice quintet of players that feature four de facto point guards mm-hmm. i mean that's ridiculous versatility that is just off the charts versatility. You want to play fly around small ball. We've got a lineup that will beat you. You want to play bully ball big. We've got a lineup that will beat you. Right. That is, and we've got a coach by the way, that loves this kind of stuff. Uh, And we've got players, despite everything I just said about cat, we've got players who are willing to give for the team and sacrifice for the team. We've got a home run hitter who loves the postseason in Ant. We've got veterans who have been there for a while and done that, including Conley and Gobert and Monty Morris, not incidentally. You've got guys who are confidence players who are full of themselves in terms of confidence in Alexander Walker and Nas Reed. I, this team is ready right now for this postseason. Um, I just want to play. Wanted to play this clip at at some point. I knew I didn't really want to ask anybody uh, questions after the game about the game last night. Uh, so I was sometimes successfully, sometimes unsuccessfully asking <laughs> playoff related questions uh, in the locker room. But I think this one uh, hit. I thought this was a, a, a good answer uh, from from Ant. And you you weren't in there. So I don't no. know if you've seen this yet, but I, 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 I think this was uh, I think this was good. And with uh, where have you guys grown this season the most that's going to matter in the playoffs? Um, that's a great question. Um... Uh, that's a good question. Um, I probably would say, I think trust in Rudy. I think that's the main thing. Like all, however many players on the team that plays, me, Nikhil, Mike, Slow Mo, Jay, Nas, Cat, we all trust Rudy. Like together, like we trust to hit him in the pocket. We trust to, when we call a post up, we trust he gonna catch it and do his thing. Catch it in the pocket, make the one more. Um, trust him at the free throw line, you know, just little things like that. And um, it goes a long way and he's been playing his ass off. So I think, as far as everybody, where we've grown at is just trusting Rudy throughout the whole game. Yeah, and, and where have you seen Rudy earn that trust offensively? Just because it seems like he's played so much better. Um, I mean, he, he he comes up to you and let you know, like, <laughs> trust me, like, uh, hit me in the pocket. Trust me, I got you. And uh, I told him one game, like, bro, I'm not going to hit you in the pocket right now. And then he was like, Sack, trust me, I got you. And I hit him and he made a kick out. And we came together and we was like, yeah. And then one time, the Denver game, a couple games ago, um, I come off the screen and he's open, and I'm like, "What, bro?" <laughs> I come off the screen and he's open, and um, I'm like, I make a move on somebody and then throw the oop, and like we we talk to each other, and I'm like, "Bro, I got you, bro. Trust me." You know what I mean? So, you know, it's there. He's like my brother, man. We talk all the time. He takes me. We takes all the time, and 
Yeah, I think everybody pretty much got 100% trust him now at this point. And he makes the right play every time. That's great. Right. Yeah. And I mean, and that is relevant, <laughs> you know, to, to, right. to all of this stuff. And you, you're talking about, I was thinking when you, you were talking about, oh, you got these three centers you can use. Oh, you got the four point guards you can use. And I was like, well, I was I was going to say, like, let's start with the centers and I'm going to play this clip about Rudy. Yeah. But it's not that isn't about the centers. Right. It's about everyone. And and that's that's the real thing. And, you know, for, you know, myself and you and, you know, lots of the people listen to this who are, you know, all 82 game people. And watching it, like we see that, right? We've right. seen that trust grow, and we've seen this team profit from it, given Rudy's consistency night to night of his effort. He doesn't have a good game every night. Rudy's as dialed of a player night to night as I've ever covered in 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 my career. And I mean, my, mine's only seven years; yours is thirty five. And I would guess if you were making that list, Rudy He'd would be, be at right the top. near the top. Yeah, KG, KG would be at the right? Top. Yeah. yeah, right. Like and. So that you get that from Rudy, you get that consistency night to night from Rudy fused together with the trust, particularly 22 year old kid who, as of a year ago, had never played with a seven footer in his career, any, any time in his life, had never played with a rim rolling center, a non modern big, right? A popper, a roller, a lob threat. You know, he, right. he, he just hadn't done that. You know, um, I don't know why I said Popper. That's definitely not Rudy. But he'd never played with somebody right. like Rudy before. And that ant. And he didn't have a great opinion of Rudy. He called he Porzingis the best room protector in the NBA. And he the said he wasn't afraid Rudy of Rudy. Yeah. And he mm -hmm. said he wasn't afraid of Rudy. Yeah, I mean, that. before when when Rudy was on other rosters. Because um, he didn't so, get it. Just like we didn't get it. We didn't right. get Rudy. None right. of us got Rudy. You right. got to be an all 82 game guy to, right. to, to get Rudy. And I just think that ties into all these other little bullet points I have down about the, the team. Defensive versatility, the lineups in which you can use. Um, you know, I mean, the defensive versatility. You can switch one through five with Rudy, right? right. They've done it th this season. You can play all these weird small guard lineups because, you know, what's the – what's the negative externality of playing a, a small team you lose force which normally costs you at the rim well you can play four smalls next to rudy and you still got the rim right you know pretty well taken care of provided he isn't a matchup that he can do that it all all these things that are unlocked and that we think about for the playoffs are a product of probably one of the most like in a box players I thought of, you know, two years ago, right. Has jumped out of the box. Rudy has while still being obviously a limited offensive player. He can't shoot. He, he doesn't right. shoot. Um, he doesn't do some things, but he's done. I, I mean, he's done the thing that he said at training camp day one, where he said, I'm going to come in and I'm going to accommodate to the style of play of this roster more last year. I wanted the team to play Rudy Gobert, Utah Jazz ball. Finch has said as much, and they did. They accommodated right. to that a year ago, and they went 42 and 40 and were punching each other and everything. Right. Rudy coming in and doing that has unlocked so many other things, and then that has been elevated by the trust of the 22-year-old and, as he said, uh, everything on, on down the line. I mean, this is, that's, this is what's unlocked it, I think. I think that – at the beginning of the season, it was the top question I had preseason. Can they run a hybrid defense? We're emphasizing what Rudy does in mm -hmm. Utah and what the Wolves did two years ago and kind of mixing that, having a fly around mentality and yet a solid rim protection. And I think that blend has been remarkably honed over the mm -hmm. course of the season. I think that, uh, you know, you do see on occasion, like uh, it, it was interesting when, you know, they were talking uh, the game where Finch admitted a defensive adjustment against the Bulls. Uh, and, you know, you saw Rudy going out and contesting shots, busting his ass to get out to 20 feet. And mm -hmm. meanwhile, you know, 
being a little late or having the rim open and somebody getting it. Uh, they know immediately when something is wrong and it's not a confusing thing. It is a, oh, we didn't plan that right. That's a very different thing Great. than that, the time when the Kings came in and went small with Trey Lyles and did yeah, the old, yeah. you know, oh, you know, Rudy can be played off the court. Nobody's saying Rudy can be played off the court now that's watching the games. They're saying, all right, we caught them in a defense that was effective that combating mm. that defense for now. But the Wolves can counter and go back to another one of their many, many variations and counter that. And that's the beauty. I mean, when I say if, if the playoffs are a chess match, the, the Wolves have the equipment to be chess masters. They have the equipment. Uh, they may not have the talent even now to beat a Boston or let's say Milwaukee, Giannis and Dame or whatever, the high-end talent. But I have to think they have a lot of talent and they have a lot of options and they have a lot of versatility. And maybe they don't have the deep playoff experience with some of the guys who really matter. But uh, I would say that for a team that the casuals will think is big bully ball or whatever, right. um, there's a lot of different things in the Wolves bag right now that can be demonstrated. And the fact that Nas and Slomo have emerged in Cat's absence and then J-Mac and Monty Morris – and Naw have also emerged uh, is just uh, the only thing you worry about is that they peak too soon, you know? <laughs> I mean, at this point in time, it's it's been a lot of fun watching them play ball lately. Even with Ant missing 22 threes in a row, they were playing right. excellent basketball. Mm -hmm. and, and if you have Anthony Edwards in playoff mode the way he's been his first two playoffs, uh, in his career, and you also have him playing within the context of what the Wolves do, that ceiling is really exciting. I want to uh, let's, let's focus on the defense for for a little bit here, and then and then let's do the 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 point guards thing uh, as well. I, I, I clipped this. This is after the Rockets game on Tuesday, not the Raptors game. When when we talked to Conley. Um, about the versatility of the defense it was it was noteworthy against uh houston right who was another team who not right. only went to a small lineup but they started with a small lineup they didn't play small the whole game but they did start a small lineup and the and the wolves had to had to play against that um i asked i asked mike conley about that uh, after that rockets game here's mike have you guys grow in your ability to play against uh, a team that's looking to go play small and run and do all the choice things I thought we've done a great job, honestly. I thought about it you know, after the game, how we had to, you know, change lineups, change coverages. We had to, you know, go from our traditional defense to switching everything one through five to um, changing our offense the way we were playing just for this particular game. And, uh, you know, teams who can do that, you know, it, it bodes well later in the in the season, in the playoffs, when teams are going to throw, you know, two or three different lineups at you in different schemes. So. Hopefully, um, you know, this is the continuation of, of our learning curve and um, it's, it couldn't happen at a better time. I think that that's huge, right, Brett? I mean, that, yep, that, that, that's what we're talking about. But I think coming, you know, from Mike Conley and and this is a, a common refrain. This wasn't just after the, the right. Houston game. They've they've grown um, in that in that belief, which is, again, we know there's a, a fallacy to, to some of the Gobert versus the Clippers stuff and the Terrence Mann and and right, and all right, that right. and and what happened, but there was always some truth to it too. That was like at the end of the day, the Utah Jazz did get exposed by that. Not Rudy Gobert mm -hmm. in particular, right. but the Utah Jazz lost because they got exposed against that type of play. And the Timberwolves, Chris Finch down the line, and all the players, I think, have been intentional, particularly this season, about their awareness of that and how they need to play to be able to, I mean, I, I didn't leave it in the clip there, but I, I, what I, my next question to Mike was, it's a pretty big win to be able to do these things 
without being able, without needing to change who you have on the floor yourself. And Michael's like, yeah, we like our two big, two bigs lineups. And we, we want to stay with that. And we found out ways in which that we can do that. Well, irregardless of, you know, how the, the other team is presenting themselves in terms of personnel coverage, whatever it might be. And that they've, been integrating that over over the course of the the season you asked Mitch about that that last last night a little bit he's like we're not we don't just like test out things in the middle of the games just to test them out because we're still trying to win but he always refers to it as a different every different matchup presents a different puzzle for them right that that's his phrasing of that yeah and he loved it when you pose that question to him that way you've had a lot of puzzles mm -hmm. you know and and he he said, you know, we he pretty much is came as close to bragging as Fitch gets in terms of saying we've got the puzzles now. You know, we've you know, we've got we all the puzzles have been solved is not what he said, but that's kind of the inference I got from it. We, we, they know what card to play against this. Now right. they gotta you gotta play that card and execute it in the playoffs. This right. team could get exposed by but from a strategic point of yeah. view. Yeah. And also, I mean, let's face it. Let's talk about that Houston game for a minute. Sure. Who blitzed Houston playing small ball? Yeah, right. I mean, Monty Morris, Mike Con. I mean, uh, excuse me, Mike Conley, Slow Mo, J Mac, Nas, and Na came in and blew them off the court. Right. So who who won that small ball game? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, uh, this whole idea that. Uh, now let me throw some stats at you. Yeah. Uh, uh, over the last, this is, doesn't count last night's 48 point thing because I think that's kind of irrelevant. Uh, but <laughs> uh, in the 13 games prior to that, the cat was out. Um, the Wolves were plus 70 over their opposition in the course of going uh, uh, eight and five or nine and four, nine and four. Uh, J Matt played 195 minutes. Of those six twenty nine, and and the wolves were plus ninety one. So in other words, in the last thirteen games before Toronto, the wolves played four hundred and thirty four minutes with J Mac on the bench and were minus twenty one. Slow mo played three hundred and thirty five minutes, and the wolves were plus seventy. Slow mo sat for two hundred ninety four, and they were zero. Na played 336 minutes and they were plus 71. Na sat for 293 and they were minus one. Mm. So if you want to look at where the engine has been in this recent bout, it, we're talking about J-Max, Slomo, Na, three guys who function as point guards, who don't have to function as point guards, right. um, who two of those players – Used to be, we, we would complain about the fact that J Mac and Slow Mo shared the floor. Stop. Nobody, you know, the whole thing would right. fall apart because nobody could shoot. It well, did. all of a sudden, both of them are shooting lights out. Um, and one of the reasons is, is they're exponentially good for each other. Every single one of those players understands. I mean, people think about point guards or passing as just ball movement and everything. So much of it is creating spacing. Mm -hmm. And these guys know to vacate when somebody is in your area, move. They don't just vacate randomly. They vacate to exactly the place they need to vacate to maximize the spacing and also not incidentally to set up their own threat of being a bucket. And so Teams are scrambling around. They're moving the ball. They're moving without the ball, and they're making quick decisions. Those are the three steps in the catechism of Chris Finch's flow offense. And Finch has finally found a little lab that indicates how this whole thing works in his vision. And it is get a bunch of guys who are really smart about getting off the ball quickly Mm -hmm. vacating a space if somebody else is in it and constantly being on the move, making quick decisions. And then at the other end of the floor, we were just talking about defense before, same thing applies. All five of those guys we just talked about, Nas, Naw, J-Mac, Conley, 
and slow-mo are great gap defenders. They mm -hmm. fill the gaps. And if you remember the one time where the Wolves were having a lot of problems on defense this year, they were not gap defending well. Right. And because they've got great on-ball defense, and they can play zone, and they can switch and all these things. But if you don't fill the gaps, then all that cool stuff goes away. Mm -hmm. And so you have this quintet that has been out there. They've only played 42 minutes together. Uh, because, you know, five-man lineups in a 13-game sample is right. not going to be – plus, uh, J-Mac doesn't play the first quarter and usually not any of the third quarter. So you've got those two things. But they played 42 minutes. And in those 42 minutes, they've outscored their opponent 134 to 103. They're and plus, this is and this is without – this is not the Raptors game, obviously, because Mike Conley wasn't in there. And exactly. The, the right. quintet is J Mac, Conley, Slow Mo, Na, and Nas. Mm -hmm. So Nas is the small ball four, Slow Mo is the small ball five, the Jokic in your, you know, oh, yeah. way of thinking about it. And uh, Na, Conley, and J Mac are variously small wings who whip around, mm -hmm. you know? And so you have a situation 42 minutes. Plus 31, the Wolves will remember a plus 70 in 629 minutes. They're almost halfway there at 42. <laughs> and it's the best five-player rotation on the team in terms of plus minus, regardless of how many minutes anybody else plays. Right. They shot 26 of 46 from two-point range, 56-5. They shot 13 of 21 from three-point range at 61-9. They have 23 assists and four turnovers. That's almost a six-to-one ratio. That's not one player. That's a five-player unit mm -hmm. playing a six-to-one ratio on assist to turnovers. So, you know, you have – we just got through talking about the beauty of Rudy and the beauty of big guard – I mean, a big two bigs lineup, and they have that. And right. they also have this kind of thing. If, you know, if Houston wants to play small – especially if they want to play small with their second unit. Well, you know, let's bring on the, the riders, you know, let's bring on the, 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 all the little puts who go out there and just whip around and, and fill gaps. I mean, J Mac made a play the other night. I probably talked about it too much already, but he filled a gap on a driver. And as soon as the gap was filled and the driver paused and J Mac knew that somebody would be behind him, Yep. He went to the corner and contested the three. It wasn't a great contest because he's only six feet. But when you have a guy running at you, you're percentage. Down. Then he, somebody gets the rebound. He comes down, runs the other way to the floor, gets to the three-point line, gets a feed, and hits a three-pointer. I mean, these guys are all really smart basketball players. And as somebody who loves the game of basketball, finding ways in which brain power is exponentially enhanced because everybody knows. I, I said something about uh, slow-mo about do uh, you think one of the reasons that you play well in that lineup is because you operate from the, the high post and everybody else is kind of on the perimeter. He goes, no, I just think we all just think it out. We work well together. I mean, what he's saying is, you know, don't, don't, get it confused with positions because everybody's moving. Everybody is knowing where everybody's wanting to go. It's, it's almost, it's five person telepathy and it's not telepathy knowing what they're going to do because of their habits. It's knowing what they're going to do because it's the right thing to do. And all five people know what the right thing to do is. And they've begun to assume that everybody's going to be doing the right thing. It's just beautiful. I want to, I mean, I, 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 I'm not saying those numbers weren't straightforward. I want to distill it down because I was thinking of something in particular. You and I were in Indiana and Cleveland for the first two games. This team played right. without cap. You know, we got there and it was that day, basically, yeah. right? That that yeah. it happened. And I remember what we talked about after the game was, one, obviously replacing cap, right? That was, right. that's where it started. And you go, okay, Nas, right? Right. You know, that that was that was it, it's going to be Nas that replaces him. But then what I think maybe after the Cleveland game, what we talked about was, oh, yeah, now that Nas has replaced Cat, who is going to replace Nas? 
off the bench. We were talking about backfilling that. Right. And, and what it's been is they've replaced Cat with Nas, and then they have replaced Nas with Slow Mo, <laughs> Nikhil Alexander Walker, and Jordan McLaughlin in, in right. different sort of lineup combinations yeah. that fill that. And you have just said the numbers of what that all is, and it's been as good or better than what Nas was previously. It was a pretty basic puzzle of slide this here, what slides in there, and what they have slid in there, the, the Nas spot, has been, I think, one of Finch's best coaching maneuvers of his entire time here because how many people would have been like, oh, yeah, we're going to replace Nas Reed, who everyone still thinks is the center for some reason, with Jordan McLaughlin. Nikhil Alexander Walker, <laughs> Kyle Anderson, three point guards. You know, I mean, Kyle's big. He plays, you know, right. he's, also, he's a point guard and he's a four, right. just not a three. <laughs> um, but like, that's what's worked. They figured that they figured that part out, and so much so that it's even buoyed a terrible ant stretch, ant's worst stretch. And, of, and of the that's season. what is crazy is that all those gaudy numbers I just read out. Do not have Rudy Gobert or Anthony Edwards on the floor. Right. Who are hands down the, two, the Wolves' two best players. And then through the playoff lens, right, You go, you go, there's a assumption, I think logical, that Ant's going to play well. You know yes. what I'm saying? So you add right. you add that back in there. Rudy's also, like, I don't think Ru Rudy's playing well too, but, like, I, I mean, he's still clearly dealing with the rib thing too. Yeah. Like, come, come the – the, the playoffs, like you should be able to get some of that production that we're talking about from the others here while also getting almost assuredly a better Anthony Edwards than you've been getting recently. Uh, but also just some more game to game impact in terms of plus minus numbers and all that stuff uh, with Rudy. And then, you know, the elephant in the room of reintegra reintegrating cat too, which right. we talked about for the first 25 right. minutes um, that that's, <laughs> You know that's an element and a tricky one. I, I I agree, absolutely tricky too. But you have these things that you figured out with likely or at least theoretical added ammunition. Um, in in addition to that, and that's why I think other teams around the league should be scared of the Wolves' upside. I, I want to ask you a question. Yep. Um, because you know the Denver Nuggets well. Um. You know, you're, you're tight with their podcasters and they're some of their smarter observers of that team. And you consequently watch that team a lot. Mm -hmm. They became a personal favorite of yours last year. Sure. Um, one of the things that and, – and, and by the way, you were early thinking that Denver was going to win it all. Uh, one of the things that I have noticed in this recent spout of games – is guys like Na and Nas who don't have a backlog of key greatness to rely on and are really confidence-oriented players are playing with a swagger now that is going to be hard to erase, going to be hard to get into. Uh, and Rudy really looks like the kind of guy who is thinking this is the year that we do this and I get this playoff, you know, monkey off the back. And is somebody you just, you know, check the box and he'll be there. Uh, and Conley also seems like there's a little bit of a buoyancy in the way he's describing this team. I think attitude We've seen a lot of teams and a lot of Wolves teams. I've seen a lot of Wolves teams go into playoffs with false swagger, you know, talking like, you know, we don't, you know, we've, we've made these steps. And so we'll begin to do this or that. Um, but there are other, the teams that really do well in the postseason are the teams that um, <clears throat> have that kind of quiet. Yeah. Deep, Denver deep, had that. Deep, yeah. And I remember asking Finch about chemistry. Uh, Flip Saunders used to describe it as a, everybody knew the pecking order. And he said, I don't, you know, I don't really have. And then he said, well, I guess I would define chemistry as 
a team gets on every time the team takes the court, they think they're going to win. Right. And uh, what I would say, and I want to know from you, do you think that the Wolves are gaining that type of mental edge coming into the most important part of the season? Gaining, yes. There, no. Uh-huh. Um, and and I think what you're referencing, and I mean, people who listened last year when we were talking about Denver, um, I think we we did this after the Nuggets had had beaten the the Wolves, and I always travel to. I don't go to all the, the road games. I always do the the Denver one. I, I like that trip. Um, and and what I said a year ago at that time was, I, I was just at a bunch of Nuggets games last right. year. I I like got there a day early one time and went and covered a not covered, but I was in the media area, right, right. for a, a Nuggets Blazers game even. So it was probably like, I don't know, I mean, at Ball Arena covered five, six. And Nuggets then the games. playoffs, right. Yeah, and then the, the playoffs. So it was like, and I, I, I don't know what it was, but I, I felt that. Like, I, I uh-huh. felt what Flip was talking about. And I talked right. about it at, at the time when, when, when we were, when we were there, like, not just business, but like, the expectation that our business is going to make money, you know, and, and, and Denver and Denver had that. And I think about last week, last Friday, um, being in Denver and ants comments after the game in particular, well, you know, he's being asked by some of the Denver reporters about like, you know, like where are you guys at in comparison to, to Denver And, and ant did his thing where he's like, you know, respect to them. They got the best player in the world. He said that, um, they're the defending champs. I think they're going to make a, a deep run again, but we're close. And he said, I'll be able to answer that question once we have our best player back. You know, <laughs> I know. I, talk, talking about cat. Right. I know. And, I know. And, and and I think that's what it is to get what we're just what you're asking, what we're describing, or what I've described of Denver last year, what the wolves need is that belief with Carl in the fold. <laughs> if they get that again, and if it's in like the first round or whatever, they play Sacramento or who new Orleans or whoever it is. And, and they do integrate cat and they have the confidence that they have right now, but with cat in the fold too, of again, another real, real weapon. Then yeah, I think, I think they're there. And that's why I go back to what I said at the beginning to win the championship with their go to the finals, come out of the West. Right it requires the effective reintegration of cat because I think to win, it requires that mentality and that, that, that belief they need cat. I think to have that level of elite belief, which the nuggets had, which is why they won the champ. It's why they knocked out Phoenix. It's why they, you know, beat LeBron and, and the Lakers. And it's why they took care of business um, in, in the championship as well. I think that's a, that's a good question. I think as of today, April 4th, you know, that that's, that's where I'm at, and that's why I'm falling back on the. They still need cap. Uh huh, and and that makes sense to me. And I agreed with you when you said, "Do they need cat to go all the way?" I I would agree with that. Um, it is. I mean, l- let's go to what we we talked about at the beginning. Um, can, can I plug in one more Denver thing? Yeah, by all on means, my sure. mind. Um, sure. So I did a, I think I've talked about this with you before, where I think of that Denver matchup in particular. Um, last year, they put KCP on Ant and they put Gordon on Cat. And what I've been saying for a couple of months is I'm like, Ant's just different now. Like, you right. can't not put your best guy to guard Ant on someone else. Right. And and I said, and, and I said that to yeah, Adam and, and Harrison, uh, who, who, cover, who cover the Nuggets, and they were like, no. Like, uh, you put KCP on him. I don't think like you have to put Gordon on him. And, and what they were like, I, what I said was, I was like, you, when the nuggets play the Mavericks, Gordon guards Luca. And, and, and Adam was like, well, that's because Luca is bigger. He's six, eight, you know, he's stronger and, and all that. And I pushed back on the, the strength stronger. thing. Cause right. I, I was like, <laughs> I, I think that's pretty close. You have right. different type of strengths or whatever. Um, But what, like, We'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll see how they end up approaching that. But I think it's a important part of the cap piece of this where 
maybe Mike Malone and Ryan Saunders, who who runs the defense, will opt to put Aaron Gordon on Carl Anthony Towns. And, and that, in my opinion, will fuel and empower Anthony Edwards to have an even an, an even better series there. If yeah. Carl isn't even in the mix, you don't even have that possibility. I disagree. Of, of, okay, go ahead. I mean, I, I, I was with you right up until that last sentence. I think that uh, if Gordon is on Nas, I think that's a problem. I think that's a problem for Denver. I, he's faster. I, I I think I would still, I mean, I would still put Gordon on Ant. I mean, I, that's yeah. my point though. Right. I mean, again, yeah. uh, you still face the matchup thing though. Uh, Gordon on cat isn't necessarily a killer either. That's the thing. That's why the, the I think the Wolves you asked me before, and it, nothing against Denver. It was all about matchups. Uh, I don't think the Wolves in Denver is – the Wolves are really good against Denver. They are not as good against the rest of the league as Denver is against the rest of the league. Right. But when those two teams play each other, I like Minnesota's chances. And part of it is you don't cut off the head of the snake because the guy's the best player in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but you definitely – um, it changes the way they operate. And sure. now, you know, in Jamal Murray coming back, he didn't play that last game and it, it really mattered. Uh, I'm not discounting that. And I think Jamal Murray, playoff Jamal Murray is like playoff Ant. I mean, it's a different beast and he's phenomenal. Sure. And so I'm not, I'm not down saying Denver. I'm just saying that, um, this Wolves team now, with or without Cat, gives Denver problems. And Nas is one of the reasons for that, if he has to be. Is he better than Cat for those matchups? That's really debatable. If Cat is at full strength and you can bring Nas off the bench versus vice versa, absolutely. I think Cat is a better option. Well, um, I mean, and that's just, again, that's part of the thing, too, is that now that's 48 minutes. Of, of those guys, right? 48 exactly. minutes of yep. Denver needing to make the choice of what they're prioritizing. Yeah. Trying to Christian take Brown or Peyton uh, Watson. Right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So that's like, again, that's why it's the fusion. You're right. Maybe I said right. that too simply of, of cat because it won't just be cat, you know, particularly right. if cats on some sort of minutes restriction or whatever, like you're going to need Nas there too. And I guess that's my point is you do, you know, yeah. is right. if you have cat back, you still have Nas to, to operate accordingly and, and however you want to, you know, handle. and with, with a backup point guard who he likes, I'm sure. I mean, if it's J Mac, J Mac and, and Nas are, you know, twined mm -hmm. uh, and have been, I mean, they're the J Mac uh, Nas in the last 13 games, 104 minutes plus one plus 63. 63 in 104 minutes. Uh, so the you know, uh, 104 minutes, 96 minutes is two ball games. So uh, 96 minutes and then two thirds of a quarter, uh, you outscore somebody by 63 points. That's two 30 point wins and a three point win or something. You know, it's, it's like just... the Raptors. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, and then you got. Uh, J Mac turns every team into the Raptors. I think that's what we J Mac and Slow Mo, 114 <laughs> minutes together, plus 77. Right. I mean, a lot of those are loaded in one time and whatever, but it's it's true. Again, to everybody who's been watching, you're seeing it, you know? Yeah. And and right. and the most encouraging part of it to me, numbers aside, is the starters have gone down. I mean, a bunch of these games recently, it's been like middle of the end of the first quarter, whatever, down 12, you down 14 right, or whatever. Right, right, right. And those lineups bring the Wolves, you know, back into the game. Not even always against other second units right. too, because the Wolves mix it right, right. so much. It's just those groups are effective. And it's a it's a big, it, it's just a big part of all of it. The, the, this looking at it through a playoff lens. And I mean, 
and we don't have to do the the whole like what's the the playoff rotation thing but you got a pretty good nine man group right now that, that's playing really well and cat's going to come back at some point and that's going to be 10 and last year in the playoffs the wolves played about seven guys you know right. part of that exactly. was injuries and all that stuff maybe they can get to nine but there is going to be some picking and choosing of how many players even play. And then also Mike Conley's going to play six, eight more minutes a night. Right. Rudy's going to play a couple more minutes. I mean, right. foul trouble withstanding. I guess that's a, a good added benefit of all this. If Kat or Nas or Rudy or whoever does get in foul trouble, you you don't feel like anywhere near expo as exposed as like the Nuggets do. Right. If Jokic gets in Absolutely. foul trouble. But and, like, and, they need to figure that out the rotation too. And what's crazy is, um, I mean, I asked Finch. It is the question. It is... Um, in the playoffs, the consensus of opinion is you shorten your bench and you rely more on ISO basketball because mm -hmm. that's you beat your best with their best, whatever, you know. Right. Uh, the Wolves have been playing well countering that. Uh, they have expanded their bench and they play far less ISO. Um, can that work in the playoffs? It's a very different environment, atmosphere. Right. Um, and I think they will have to split the difference to some some part. And that brings us here toward the end of this podcast to the beginning. I don't think J-Mac and Monty Morris can play together. I think they will each share a role or one of them will have that role. And I think it's going to be Monty Morris, um, despite the fact that it is <laughs> that to bench J-Mac when he's just been so obviously unbelievable. And this isn't new. I mean, it's... it's the shooting's after, new, but the plus minus isn't new. After a while, you just got to say, who knows what genie rubbed the lamp to make this guy the guy who, when he steps on the court, the Wolves beat their opponents. But why would you mess with that magic? You know, I mean, yeah. there is a part of you that says, what does J-Mac have to do in terms of improving the team that he right. hasn't done already? And the arguments are, Monty Morris is a little larger. He has playoff experience. I think he's a better on-ball defender, as good as J-Mac has been. Monty Marsh is an excellent on-ball defender. And the other team isn't necessarily uh, not going to stop going ISO. Uh, and so – and he can hit a shot. You know, he started over 130 NBA games the previous two years. Uh, he's a cool head. Connolly trusts him. Finch loves him. Uh, and yet – it means you put this guy who's been like Mr. Elixir for you right. on the bench. It's a crazy circumstance. Well, and and just in case there's some people who maybe are just listening to this now and weren't listening to Dane and Brit pods in April of three years ago, you know, J Mac has done this consistently. The he's been a plus minus leader on this team over the sample size of his career. I mean, five years. This is not only the thigh injury, new. or the heel, or the quad. Yep. You know, whatever the injury that was. was the cat. It was the same yeah, thing as yeah, injury, same thing right, as right. cat. Right. I mean, like, I, I I would get if there's some people listening to these stats that Brits rattling off. And you're like, oh, that's a little bit of a flash in the pan, right? Given given that the sample size, if you don't know the broader context, is what I'm saying, right? Right. And and what is giving you as much fire behind this? as as you have is you've written 10 columns on Jordan McLaughlin <laughs> over the course of the last five years about him doing this exactly. And the new bit with J Mac is he's now shooting 50% from three this season too. I and used to have the, before. I almost like, as you, you're right. I've written a number of columns on him and I would go back and look at the paragraph, my caveat paragraph where <laughs> there are two things that J Mac doesn't do shoot well, and he can get bullied in on-ball defense. Both of those things have dramatically improved. Mm -hmm. I would actually say that the defense is more sustainable than the shooting. Right. He's not going to shoot 60% from three indefinitely. Right. Sooner or later, he's going to have to cool off, even though, as Finch points out, he's often on the court with other point guards. He gets the ball in rhythm. 
He knows he's going to be getting the ball because, as I just mentioned, everybody knows that the other people are doing yeah. the right thing, so on and so forth. Um, but his on-ball defense, he says he worked really hard in the offseason and got a lot stronger. You could mm-hmm. see that. Um, he used to front people who were bigs, uh, which was a bold strategy that required somebody to backfill if it didn't work. Uh, now he is, if he happens to get locked in a mismatch, he's, he holds his ground and, you know, tries to use his hands and poke check and everything, but he does try to basically be a bulwark and stand his ground until help arrives. Right. And he's not bad at it, you know? And so it is, it's, it's th- what is, what makes what makes the cat discussion fascinating and contentious as we just demonstrated is the, uh, the pluses and minuses there are distinct and they are, um, do you gamble on the upside? Do you worry too much about the downside, you know, et cetera with J Mac and Monty Morris, it's a matter of what type of goodness do you want right. and the alternative being, can you share the goodness? That's where I would say probably not. I don't think both of them doing what they do in these playoffs. I think you need rotations where you need the guys who matter for you on the court. I mean, theoretically matter. Jay Mack apparently matters, but, uh, and, and so it is a situation where, uh, you have to pick and choose. And um, in that instance, I do think it crazy as it sounds, you know, it, what it comes down to is J-Mac probably has to go to another team and just go crazy for them, you know? Yeah, well, cross that bridge when you get yeah. there. Unrestricted free agency um, right. this summer. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think we could <laughs> – well, we will talk again, obviously, uh, yeah. about the playoffs. There's a handful of other – different things we didn't get as as deep into uh with this but i think maybe put a pin in it uh here i just want to uh for listeners kind of do well two things uh first we have our uh, final pair of tickets to to give away uh for this season for tuesday's uh game against uh the the wizards um we've been doing it kind of all season as a thank you to patreon subscribers uh where we give away they're, they're nice seats um kind of middle of the floor lower level or middle of the section, lower level. Um, and for if you are a Patreon subscriber, I just send us a, a message there that you're available. That's the Wizards game uh, on on Tuesday. I think one of uh, one of the final uh, home games of the season. Just send us a message uh, that you're uh, available for that. Or if you want to become a Patreon subscriber, uh, you can do that at patreoncom slash NBA. It's in the show notes uh, with with a link. If you if you want to click on that uh, there, we'll pick someone out on, on Tuesday morning uh, for for those tickets. And then also just a little scheduling update. Um, Kyle and I normally go on Friday mornings, but we're going to actually wait to go, uh, until Monday morning, um, which is after the Wolves play the Suns and the Lakers this weekend. So we're going to kind of hit on Kyle and I'll hit on, uh, both of those. Chris normally does Mondays, but he's traveling, uh, back on, on Monday morning. So we'll hit, uh, we'll hit Chris on, on, on Tuesday there, but, but that's, what's coming up. So just know, you know, in your feed if you're looking over the course of the weekend this dane and brit pod is going to be the the last one of of this week uh brit anything else no i think that that'll do it i i do want to i guess maybe say also there is an option that neither monte morris nor j yeah. Mac play uh mm-hmm. which if finch wants to go with eight and have Nah slow-mo and presumably if cats back Nas mm-hmm. as his bench um then that's another possibility. Yeah, what you stood up, what you said to me last night, of oh, you said, "What I want to see in the playoffs is different things," and yep. and and I and do. what what that means is schematic versatility, different rotations, different like different players who are in the rotation. Where normally, like initially, my head went like, eh, "Well, there there is value in doing the same thing over and over." Players knowing their role in the the game or the rotation or whatever it might be. But it is, they are in a unique scenario in which they can play a bunch of different coverages or a 
bunch of different coverages defensively, but certain personnel play some of those coverages better than others. They can play certain styles of offense better um, with certain personnel than they can with others. And just some series might just have different players that do it. And I think your point there, while I think it's a bit of a risk, is an interesting proposition and one that maybe makes sense for this team given the fact that they are proving to be as deep as they are and are about to get deeper if slash when, you know, Carl Anthony Towns, you know, reintegrates in into this mix. That's going to, I mean, that's, that's the, that's the big question here, right? Is, yeah. If, they, if it is a chess match, there are moves. You right. don't have to basically play chess the same way over and over again. It makes mm -hmm. you predictable and therefore creates a stronger, response from your opponent if your opponent responds and you go okay that's the response huh well then here's this try this right. and and i think being proactively aggressive uh doesn't necessarily i think this team is solid enough in the locker room and that's what i was saying i think it can handle it right like yeah yeah I, I, that's the sense i get maybe not you know we're not coaches, i know i know, we don't I know. Mean, and, and that's yeah. that's up to finch and mm -hmm. and the folks in that locker room but I mean, it's been a charm season, and, you know, I mean, as I'm looking now, they clinched a third seed, and uh, I looked it over. You know, Dallas has got a shot at the fourth seed. Uh, I, think I think Dallas is going to get the fourth seed. Well, uh, and, and the Clippers could fall to six. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's fascinating. And Clippers, I guess, theoretically could fall to seven, and, you know, it could be a Wolves-Clippers matchup. But anyway, that's mm -hmm. we won't open that can of worms right now. I, I will say one more thing. Uh, congratulations, Luca Garza got an NBA contract today. Um, oh, I, probably I, didn't, I think that, that happened while we were recording or, or, <laughs> or right before I texted someone. Must have been that 16 point out nine minutes, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, so he, he what, what the important part of that, I don't know how important it is, but it does make him playoff eligible. Um, oh. whereas if you were a two way player. I wouldn't be, I asked someone and it it's not one of those multi-year contracts. It's just for the rest of this season. There's no Gupta specialness to it, okay. but, but he will be, um, yeah, he will be playoff eligible. And um, I don't know if, if you go can... 90 minutes before the game, you'll see him launching threes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we'll be sitting out there watching it. I don't know. Just good for the kid. He's, he's, uh, yeah. he's worked hard. He's, he's just... worked hard. Um, right. and yeah, it was <laughs> too bad there aren't more like live game defensive drills. But. <laughs> I, you know, I, I was just thinking it's like there might be for somebody like Luca Garza, you know, you see some of these teams in April and stuff like this, like Toronto last night. It's like imagine I mean, what he could be doing right, right, now for right. The so, you Raptors, he could be getting. You know, well, they, at, at the, the very center, least, they started, a minimum deal, right? They started a center who they yesterday who they signed on a ten day contract yesterday, and he, he started. So Luca Luca Garza, I, I like obviously is better than a lot of players. There are, are literally five teams. teams in the yeah. NBA right now where if Luca Garza was playing center, they would still lose. The tanking would not be yeah, affected, right. but he would be putting up you know twenty two and eight, you know. Mm -hmm. And and everybody would be going, hey, you know that guy might be worth a four million dollar flyer. You know, I mean, yeah. he could be doing more, and the Wolves are probably smart to kind of mm -hmm. hedge that loyalty gene a little bit more because I think I've always said this that Luca Garza is a trade chip. You know, he there he's got enough skill to intrigue people, and he could be a throw in to sweeten a deal. Um, Somewhere yeah, I, I actually I, I don't know how it works exactly once it's a rest of season con. I know if you would have gone into no, free it won't agency, be, yeah, yeah. Oh, you mean you would have been restricted? Yeah. You yeah. would have been restricted if you would have gone into free agency as a two way guy. I would assume now that he's on a minimum deal, he's unrestricted uh, this summer. So we'll we'll see. So maybe they they resign him. him. <laughs> yeah, I mean they're going to need to have some minimum guys on the roster right, next right, year. Right. I guess it's a question of how valuable is it to have a really right. good fourth center but i don't know it proved to be valuable a little bit this <laughs> this season so uh we'll see just wanted to make sure i i noted that at, at some yeah. point uh but this this was awesome uh we have 10 more days left uh in the season so we'll do yeah at least one more pod before the the regular season is and over then the and falling then, knife 
Yeah, yeah, Fallen Knife on yeah the 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 19th. So everyone, right. um, yeah, write that down. Write that down right now. Six o'clock, Fallen Knife. Get there, get a spot. Hopefully, we have some you know nice weather so people can be outside too. There's like there will be. We'll know the we'll matchup. Recording. We will know the matchup because yeah. the seven eight will be played. Mm -hmm. Well, it's gonna be it's on the 19th, so they could they could theoretically be playing their first game the, the next, next day night. on the 20th. Yeah, the the right, first exactly. game is the 20th. Um, or or the, the, the are there games on the 19th? Will the final eight nine game be or this you know the winners of the winner loser game for the I, final slot? I'm pretty sure when I when we were trying to schedule this, I think there's a game on the 19th. Okay. And then that team that wins, they play their first game on the 21st. If that and makes if the sense. Wolves, if the Wolves are the number one seed, it may be the game to determine the Wolves yeah. opponent. Yeah. I keep well, assuming that Denver, you know, Denver's schedule, if you look at it, it mm -hmm. I I'll be very surprised. Even if the Wolves beat Denver, I don't see that happening. Um, well, it's the Wolves' next four is as tough as it can be, given that one of the four is against the Wizards. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right, like right, at right. Phoenix, at, yeah. at LA, uh, and then home for the Wizards back to back uh, to, to Denver. But hopefully on the 19th, we can also like do the show and then watch that game there too. Right, Just like sure. kind of kind of hang out afterwards, or even better, we know the opponent, so that'd right. be great. Mm -hmm. He's Britt Robson. Um, following him on Twitter uh, at Britt Robson again. Um, I will be uh, back with Kyle on Monday morning. Nothing else uh, over the course of this week, and we're not going to do anything after the Suns, the the Suns game on Friday. Take kind of our last weekend off uh, here here for a while. But uh, Britt, I appreciate you doing it. Until Monday morning with Kyle, he's Britt. I'm Dane at Dane Moore MBA. Yeah, till Monday. Peace out. How I'm feeling, man, I hope it never stop, yeah. Green and hot so you can find me in the crowd, yeah, yeah. Don't let standards ever, ever bring you down, yeah.